Hello, Oscillator Sync here, and today we're back with the Korg ModWave. This is the second video in the series where we are taking a deep dive into the ModWave's sequencer. In the first video, we introduced the sequencer, discussed what it actually is and what it is not, and why it is maybe a little bit strange on a polyphonic synth, but also wonderful. Uh, we also introduced some of the common concepts across the whole of the sequencer, and then sort of dove into the pitch sequencing track. If you haven't seen that video yet and you're not familiar with the sequencer, it might be worth at least going back and watching the first half of that video, perhaps. Um, because I will skim over some of the concepts I've already covered, but I'll, I'll try not to leave anyone behind if you haven't um, seen that video. I'll do my very best. So in this video, the plan is to take a look at two more aspects of the sequencer. We're going to be looking at these Assignal ABCD motion sequencing lanes, and we'll also, um, towards the end of the video, take a look at the uh, shape lane, which is also um, pretty interesting and unusual, like many things uh, about the sequencer on this synth. So um, I guess without further ado, let's dive into that, shall we? So we took a look at the pitch lane, which can only be used to modulate pitch. The A, B, C and D lanes are freely assignable to modulate any parameter which is accessible in the mod matrix, which is basically any parameter on the synth, uh, including aspects of the sequence that it's actually running use the sequence to modify itself, which is uh, kind of wild. Um, on the face of it, if you use them in a basic way, they're somewhat like the uh, motion sequencing that you found on, say, the Minilog and the Monolog and a number of other um, cork synths, the Volkers, for example, where um, you can essentially record a knob movement into the sequence. Uh, and, and that's one way that we can actually program sequences on the sequencer lane. So let's just take a look at that. So we're on sequencer lane uh, A here. Um, we need to choose the length of the loop to begin with if we're going to record something in. Uh, so I've just gone with 16 beats, so A1 to A16, that, that won't do me. And uh, let's record, say, a filter sweep in. So um, if I hit record here, it's going to ask me which lane I want to record to. We can also record to the pitch. This works slightly differently, playing notes in, obviously. But we're going to record to A. It says ready to record, play a note to start, hold the note down until you're done recording. If you hold a note down past the length of the loop, uh, it will stop recording anyway. So we're going to record 16 steps here, no matter how long I um, continue to hold down the note. So I'm going to play a note, grab the cutoff knob and give it a wiggle. And now it's finished recording and we can hear it playing back, right? So that is basically emulating what we normally do on the uh, old, uh, more basic motion sequencing that we found on previous Korg synths. So if we look now at the um, sequencer lane settings, we can see that it says rec knob filter cost off. So it's telling us that the um, shape of this particular um, sequence was uh, created by me playing with the cutoff knob. And if we go into each step, we can see that we have um, values set on each of the steps now. The values will range from 100% positive to 100% negative. So this means that the um, sequencer lanes are bipolar. We can use it to modulate down as well as up. Um, we heard when we played a note that we were getting that shape that I recorded in. And if we now look in the mod matrix, we should be able to see here, yes, indeed, uh, we have a mapping going from filter cutoff, or rather from step sequencer A to the filter cutoff. It's set the intensity at maximum, and that's what's currently being modulated. The important thing to note here is that the fact that it has been sent to the filter cutoff and the fact that it says that the filter cutoff was what was used to record this motion, that's all optional, it's advisory. Um, we don't have to now have this going to the filter cutoff. In fact, if we come into the mod matrix here, we can go ahead, uh, do shift and mod. Do I want to delete that mapping? Yes. We're now not hearing anything um, be modulated. If we look at our steps, 
all of the values are still there. Um, it should also still say that we used, okay, so once we've removed the last mapping, it removes the recording knob there, but we can now go into our mod matrix and assign that to something else. So maybe the uh, position of the wavetable. So we can wiggle that um, and our source can be step sequence A. And if we turn up the intensity, we can hear that same movement now being applied to our wavetable position. What if we wanted to send that to somewhere else as well? Maybe we want that to also do the morph control. We can do that again. So morph and we'll come from step sequence A and to continue, turn up the intensity. And now that um, motion sequence is modulating both of those uh, parameters. We don't need to be modulating by the same amount or we could even invert it which is going to sound the same for this actually, but so although we used cutoff to record this um, motion sequence, it is completely um, uh, separated from that fact. It assigned it to the mod matrix um, by default, because that's presumably what you would want, but we don't have to then apply this to the cutoff. We can remove that mapping and we can also apply it to multiple different locations at the same time as well. So I've just cleared everything out and I'm just going to re-record that uh, cutoff movement because it's um, a nice easy one to hear and I'm just going to do slightly more dramatic moves just um, so that uh, going forwards we can hear it more clearly. So, um So there we go, that's um, uh, a sequence back on here. So one thing I want to um, note at this point is that what I just recorded in terms of the knob movements that I did and what is playing back is not quite the same thing. And the reason for that is that even though we were moving the knob and we were doing it with continuous movement, obviously, as we can see that each one of the steps still has a value assigned to it, which is based upon the movement of that knob. And we can come in here and edit that, of course, if we wanted that first one to be less um, obvious. Uh, and the reason this isn't quite the same is because the movements are still quantized to the knobs. And what's happening by default is if we come into uh, the setup for this sequencer, the transition is set to linear, and that's going to create smooth transitions between the steps. And because the, the sequence is moving pretty fast, it's going to sound more or less the same. If this was a slower sequence, uh, less so. But we can change the transitions. Um, so if we wanted to get subtle variations on this, we can move to exponential or logarithmic, which makes all the movements slightly more um, fast. And then, of course, we could turn the transitions off altogether. And we get a more rhythmic thing, kind of like a sample and hold. So recording the knob movements in and then deciding whether or not you want to have transitions is going to give you different kind of vibes. And of course we should not, um, sorry, that's transition off. Uh, this is individual transitions. Uh, the transition for each step is currently off, but if I came into this one and maybe made that one linear, we can hear that we've got a smooth one there. And we can start putting in smoother slides and so on, the same way that we did with our pitch. So we can take these sort of random um, knob movements and by switching it to individual and putting in transitions on particular steps, we can get these really interesting. rhythmic things going on, which are part sample and hold, part slid. Oh, it's a really great way to start finding these sort of rhythmic ideas.
So I'm just going to set that back to transitions being turned off. So we get these steppy friends again. And I want to take a look at one of the other parameters that we have on a per step basis. So let's just come into um, on one of our steps here. And here we have uh, the type um, setting. And this is, um, this is pretty interesting um, because this allows us to modify, um, modify the value of the step and also modify how the value of the step is being modified. Um, maybe to make this a little bit clearer, let's make a shorter sequence and maybe a slower sequence just so we can hear what's going on. So I will just set this just like a four step sequence instead. We'll just drop the tempo down to say 80. Uh, 33 minus 17. Let me make this one. So we can hear a nice obvious um, pattern going on there. So um, I'm actually going to ignore the first setting to begin with on this type parameter and um, we'll come back to that uh, and I'll just start with these um, other two here uh, which is um, value times random plus or minus and value times random plus. So what these will do is apply a random um, scalar to the value that we have on the step and I'm just going to use it on a, slight, on a different step actually because it's going to make more sense, make it easier to hear maybe on this one. So what this is going to do is scale the um, the value randomly. So this third step is going to change each time, whereas the other um, three are going to be the same. And the difference between these values is going to be that the um, times random plus minus is going to also send it negative. Whereas if we have it to this one, it's always going to be positive. It just might not be as positive as it was. And remember, this has been set per step. So we're able to have a mostly consistent sequence, but then have one or two steps potentially, which are throwing in an amount of randomness as well. And that's really cool. Might be cool if we also change the transition on this one, Buzz. Because at the moment the transition is set to uh, so now we've got this step here being randomly scaled and we also get a transition on it whereas all the other ones are steppy. So there's a lot we can do with that to, again, to me it always feels about creating these interesting rhythmic ideas that can be modified as they go. Uh, so those are the two random um, things here. So let's have a look at the other two, which are value and continuous mod and value and sample and hold mod. So to make these two really, really clear, I'm just going to reassign where this uh, modulation is going uh, and send it to pitch instead. Uh, so we will uh, just delete uh, that modulation and we will add a modulation. Uh, Shall we just turn down one of these perhaps? We'll just send it to the uh, tuning of this oscillator, that will do. Uh, so add tuning of this oscillator and the source can be step sequence A and we'll do it sorry this is going to be <laughs> a slightly annoying sequence to listen to I apologize uh, but it will make what I'm trying to show hopefully really really clear so um, what are we looking at here? So value and continuous mod. What this uh, is going to relate to is if we are going to be modulating the value of this step. So remember that the value for each step in each sequencer 
is a modulation destination. So we're not modulating every value in the uh, sequencer, we are modulating just the value of this step, which, as I mentioned before, is bonkers. Uh, so let's um, assign a uh, modulation to the value here. So we'll add a modulation here. We're going to use the current uh, step sequence A, A3 value. So that's that step. And I'll just send it, uh, let's say this is the pitch LFO will probably work. And we'll give it a fair whack of intensity. And what we should hear now is just on step C, it's being modulated by the pitch LFO. And if we change the frequency of this, we can hear that it's being modulated on that step. <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny, uh, but apparently I do. <laughs> so that's that. So um, coming back to this um, type setting here, value plus continuous mod means that um, when we get to this step, we are going to have the value and it's going to apply any modulation that's coming into the value in real time. And we will hear it change continuously over the course of that step happening, which might be what you want. The other option is this value plus sample and hold mod. And what this is going to do is slightly different. When we get to the step, it's going to look at what the incoming modulation looks like, and it's going to lock it at the start of the step, and then it's not going to change it for the duration of the step. Next time it comes around, it's going to look at where it uh, is uh, that time, and it's going to lock it at the start of the step again. So we'll hear something that sounds a bit like the random um, thing that we had before, but it will be periodic based on the LFO in this case. So you can hear we've not got that constant movement happening on the step now. Instead, it's basically looking at where the LFO is at that particular point and adding it to the value there. So the difference between this and our friend there with the bending notes instead. This feature, the value type plus sample and hold mod, is missing from the pitch track, which is a bummer because it means that whenever we want to modulate uh, a individual step on the pitch sequencer, we're always going to hear that movement if movement is happening. We can kind of get around that by using one of the stepped random um, LFO shapes instead. But Korg, please, I'm asking nicely, can we please have the sample and hold mod as an option on the pitch sequence? Please, pretty please, 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 please. So one trick that we can now do, um, knowing that we have this sample and hold mod in the sequencer lane, is that we can use one of our sequencer lanes, or as many as we want, actually, um, as a clocked sample and hold, essentially. So um, if I come back here and I set the length of my um, sequence to just one step, just this step here, and if I set this value to zero, this is essentially doing nothing to the pitch now. Right, um, if I come into um, here and set that to value plus sample and hold mod, and we add the LFO as a modulation source for that this time, uh, we'll just use the same one. I will do, give it some amount. And now what we have is a sample and hold of the LFO, which is clocked to the sequencer. So if I turn the um, frequency for this down, we can hear that LFO being uh, sampled each time we get a uh, step in the sequencer, as opposed to the continuous movement. And by changing the, um, the frequency of the LFO, we can get different patterns. 
and obviously also the shape of the LFO is going to make a big difference as well. And obviously you might not want to apply this to, um, uh, to pitch necessarily, but you can see perhaps how this would um, apply to other things. This incidentally is how a lot of um, a lot of uh, like computer game sounds are made by just sample holding uh, LFOs. If we speed up the tempo there. You can definitely get that computer game vibe, right? Yeah, so, so we can also hack one of our um, signature lanes into being a sample and hold uh, based upon an LFO, which is potentially a really neat trick, depending on the patch that you're making. So I've just cleaned out the patch again just back to a standard patch. And a couple of other things I just want to mention before we get on to the shape track. The first is um, thinking about your amounts inside your sequencer lanes and how that applies to your um, uh, mod matrix settings. So um, to put uh, some context around this, let's think again about pitches, but in a slightly more controlled way this time. Um, so one of the um, limitations we identified in the previous video on the pitch uh, sequence is that we were not able to decouple the pitch of the two oscillators. The pitch um, sequence is always going to move the oscillators together in sync. But of course, we do have access to the tuning of the oscillators um, in the mod matrix, which means we can also apply uh, tuning to them based upon our sequencer lanes. And because the tuning parameter of each oscillator is separate, that means that we could also decouple the tuning of the two oscillators and have different pitch sequences running in time. So let's just take a look at how we would do that and think about how we would set up our sequencer tracks and mod matrix um, uh, settings to do that. So I'll come on to sequencer lane A here and I'll choose a step actually before I do that. Let's just make the... Um, the sequence a little bit shorter just so we don't have to do quite as much five steps will do so um what we have here in our sequence lane is this value uh, amount and this value amount is going to run from uh, zero up to 100 uh, so this is not talking in terms of semitones like we had in our um in our pitch uh, sequence so we have to think about this in a slightly different way so what can we do if we want to make sure that our sequencer lane can be used to uh, approximate or in fact not even approximate actually act in semitones so um, let's create a link in the mod matrix between this sequencer uh, lane and the tuning of oscillator one first so come into the mod matrix add a new destination we're going to adjust the tuning of oscillator one and the source is going to be sequencer lane a uh, lovely stuff so enter here we go and what we now get to do is set the intensity of this track now generally speaking you might be tempted just to whack this up to full up to 144 semitones which is a lot of semitones but that's not going to make it easy for us to actually write stuff that works in tune instead seeing as our sequencer runs from 0 to 100 if we set this intensity to be a hundred semitones that gives us a mapping of one percent in our sequencer lane to one semitone so uh, we can come out of here and we can go into one of our steps maybe the second one and maybe we want to go a fifth above so semi se uh, semi seven semitones and now we should hear something slightly weird so why is it weird two reasons the first is that we're still hearing uh, oscillator 2 as well and the next reason is we're hearing a linear movement from uh, the root note to uh, semi seven to semi seven semitones above let's say, try to say that when you're drunk um, 
So what do we want to do? We want to come into the setting for Seamless Lane A and we want to turn our transitions to either off or individual. Um, I'll put it on individual in case you want to put slides in and now we should hear. And we will put an octave up here. And maybe a octave and a fifth there and now we've created a pitch sequence which is controllable thinking in terms of semitones on this step sequencer here and our original uh, sorry our other oscillator is still held at the same pitch because we are not modulating uh, its tuning and we're not using the pitch sequencer to change its pitch either so um, if we wanted to, we could then come into our second sequencer lane here. Uh, and because I like polyrhythms, let's set it to a different length there. Eight perhaps will do fine. Make sure its transition is set to individual or off if we want that stepping. And we'll create a mapping between this sequencer and oscillator B's tuning. So a uh, new mod tuning of... Uh, oscillator 2 and the source is step sequencer B. Enter again. If we want to have a percent map to one semitone, we want to set this to 100. Yes, I know I could be holding down enter to make this go faster. Um, Campbell's remorse had gone too far by that point. There we go. Uh, and we can put in a different sequence in here. That's also a different length. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just picking numbers here, honestly. Uh, 12, maybe we can go down an octave, or two octaves, down an octave. That can be the root, that can be that, and that can be the root as well. And now what we should hear is we have our two oscillators playing different melodies, which are of different lengths, and because we've been careful about which notes we've chosen here, it sounds pretty good. And if we wanted to do the trick where we have our filter envelope maybe um, trigger based upon the sequencer stepping so we get some movement there, that might be nice. Uh, where are we? Step pulse, there we go. Lovely. We've got that sort of duophonic sequence vibe going on here. Give some reverb, why not? So, um, obviously, this is being applied to pitch and thinking about how we can uh, set the intensities to get the most out of our sequence or the most meaningful things out of our sequence. But this applies to, to most parameters. And sometimes, yeah, you're just going to want to swing it the full intensity so that you've got um, just the control over the full range. Uh, but things, um, for example, like um, envelope times, anything related to time, you probably want to think carefully about what your upper range is going to be for those things. Uh, rather than just slamming it on at um, the maximum amount. Does anyone else just like bleeps and bloops? I can listen to this sort of stuff forever. I don't know whether it's just me. And of course, we could then start throwing in things like um, probability so that the length of, the, of one of them keeps changing. Stick a slide on one of them. Yeah, so we can create two interrelated <laughs> Okay, sorry. This is meant to be a tutorial about more than just that sound over and over again. But you can see what you can start to do when you think carefully about the amounts that you're actually working with. You could, incidentally, 
now also put the pitch um, sequencer over the top of that. And if you are careful with the um, semitone amounts that you work with and how you lock it to the scale, you can create like really, really amazing evolving melodic ideas. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of fun. So again, I've just torn down the patch to just look at one last thing uh, before we move on to the shape track. And this is kind of related actually to the shape track in, in some ways. Um, so I'm just going to um, come back into Seems to Lane A and I'm going to go ahead and just record a uh, cut off wobble again, perhaps. Okay, so um, so far uh, we've been listening to the sequences as they loop, but one thing um, that I think should not be overlooked on the sequencer tracks is the way that you can use them as very complex envelopes. Now, I've recorded this just by wiggling a knob to uh, get to this point nice and easily, but um, if we come into the setup for sequencer A, um, do remember that one of the options here is to set our repeats down to off. And what this will do is play that sequence once and then stop, essentially giving us an envelope. So what we've created there is a complex sequence uh, a complex envelope made up of a sequence. And at the moment, that's all using linear transition, but it doesn't have to, and we can get different flavors by changing the transition, either uh, overall. Generally, the uh, log and exponential make it more choppy. Uh, so either changing the transition across the entire lane or by setting it to individual and setting it on a per step basis. And we can also have stepped envelopes if that happens to be your thing. Yeah, so don't overlook uh, the possibility of creating much more complex envelope patterns um, using the sequences uh, A, B, C, and D if you're not using them for other things. But just um, uh, to um, emphasize this, it will... Uh, run at the rate of the sequencer, uh, which is either going to be tempo synced or not, but you're not going to be able to decouple the speed at which the sequencer lanes run from the actual sequencer. So to finish off uh, this video, we're going to move over to the uh, shape um, lane. Uh, before we do that, I'm just going to get this back to repeating. There we go. So uh, what is the shape lane? Uh, so the shape lane is a sequenceable set of envelopes. It allows you to have a different envelope shape on each step. And then that envelope shape can be applied to any of the ABCD uh, motion sequencing tracks or indeed uh, the pitch lane as well. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that uh, cutoff pattern there. And I'm just going to turn U shape on. Now to begin with, we're not going to hear any difference. And that's because by default, this shape lane is going to basically have an envelope on every single step, which is just going to run the, um, the target step at its full amount. To make this easier to hear, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to set the length of our shape lane just to one. And come into step one. So at the moment, it just sounds like our original uh, sequence. If we come down to, uh, sorry, this um, option here, this allows us to change what envelope shape is on this step. So now we can hear we've got a triangle shape 
being applied to each of our steps in our sequence. A sine, or two, two halves of a sine. A saw down, so essentially we've got like a simple envelope on each of our steps now. A saw up, similar. And we've got lots of these different shapes here. Some of which take up the whole of the step, some of which aim to be a little bit shorter. Some of which uh, emulate ADSRs, or uh, AR envelopes, and so on. And then when it gets really interesting, if we go through some of these, I like this one as well, that sort of swoops back up, uh, we get to the point where we've got two envelopes per step happening, essentially. Let's uh, just slow this down a little bit so it's a little easier to hear. So this one's called Chug. Which I quite like. So that's two sort of shapes per step. Or even three. And then at the end we get to four. And then eventually all off. So you can see here that we've got a really interesting way that we can start to modify what's going on in a pattern. So let's talk about these other uh, settings here. So offset is going to move the overall shape up or down. So it's going to have the effect of um, essentially increasing the overall uh, value of the uh, target, which in this case is the cutoff. So if I turn this up, you can hear that it's more just kind of on the whole time. And it's going to clip off the top so we don't get quite so much of that pluckiness. And it's only on the very, very low ones, possibly the negative ones, where we're really hearing anything at all. Similarly, we can take the whole thing down as well. And that's going to move the value down before applying the shape. Level is kind of the same thing, except it's not going to move the value down. It's going to reduce by how much it's been moved up. So if we set this to 25, for example, you can still hear it going, but it's essentially it's a quieter envelope. We can go to double the amount as well. But the important thing with the level, I guess, is that we can also go negative. So we can invert our envelope shape as well. Which is pretty cool. Uh, phase is going to offset the start of this particular shape. So if we... Um, Yeah, if we go back to like 25 degrees, you can kind of hear that we're getting the start of the next, sorry, the start of our step happening at the end of the step as well. So we kind of get like, like a, a three thing happening. Tuck -tuck, tuck -tuck, tuck -tuck, like a, a triplet feel. And that's because this rise bit here is now happening at the end as well. If we go to 180, it should more or less sound like it did before because we've shifted it half out face, we're getting this part of the chug first and then that one instead. So we've reversed the pattern, if you like. And that can be an interesting way to get different variations. It's probably a little bit more interesting, actually, if we go to one of the more simple shapes. You kind of get that flutter at the end, because this ramp up is happening partially at the end now as well. It's my chug gun. There we go. Uh, and then probability does what probability do, does always. So this can get really, really interesting if we now uh, expand the uh, length of our sequence and put different envelopes on each step.
So we'll come back into the setup for this and maybe like do five or something that will do. Uh, so we can have like a chug on the first one. We could have a um, just a simple saw down on the next one. Um, maybe a swoop up like that on that one. Uh, and then uh, another... Or maybe like that one's quite fun. And then the last one, let's have like a really fast four type thing. So now we should get quite an interesting rhythmic pattern. And of course we could set the probability of this one to be lower. So we can create these really complex rhythmic enveloped patterns, which are sequenceable, which can have um, probability applied to them, and of course a lot of these parameters can also be modulated as well. Which you certainly couldn't do <laughs> with the standard sequencer that you would find on most polyphonic synths. One small last thing to mention about this just before we finish um, is that the transition setting of the target sequence does make a difference. So if you want to hear the uh, envelopes as they should be, as it were, make sure that your transitions are turned to um, off. So either off on the actual transition here or all your steps um, are set to off and you can have it on individual. Um, the differences between them are subtle. So that's as it should be. If we go to linear, everything just sounds a bit softer, right? If you listen to those attacks. It just softens the attacks a bit. And similarly with the exponential. And log, you can hear that the attacks, especially there, are quite, quite softened. It's subtle, but it's worth noting that if you want to get the full punch of what you've what you've programmed on your shape, you want to be um, having the transition set to off. Anyway, I hope that was interesting and useful. If you enjoy the video, as always, it's massively appreciated if you could give the video a little thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel uh, because we've got lots of synth stuff coming up, especially if you're interested in digging into the sequence on the mod wave. There's at least one more video coming up, um, possibly two, which will cover the rest of the tracks and look at some more um, interesting applications of the sequencer. Other than that, uh, as always, thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye.